Lisa Hamilton is going to come and talk to us about confronting the junk science concerning offender risks. I think most of us who have been in the business for a while have uh, heard all kinds of stories about recidivism <laughs> rates and this and that. And uh, you kind of wonder where a lot of this stuff came from uh, and how these rumors get started. Uh, she's going to talk to us a little bit about how to deal with that situation and uh, how to address uh, the, uh, shall we call them, alternative facts that are out there about sex offenders. So uh, one uh, quick note, just please remember uh, if you have a cell phone on your person to uh, tell it to be quiet for the next little while so it does not disturb the presentation and the people around you. So uh, without further ado, Melissa, we welcome you to the stage today. Thank you. So a, a couple apologies starting off. Um, I can't stand still and present, uh, so I'm not going to be up there, and I'm afraid I'd all fall off, which is not good for me because the last two times I have fallen, I've broken a wrist. So <laughs> if you don't mind, I will stay down here. Uh, so thank you for having me. I actually did this conference uh, three years ago in Dallas, uh, so I'm uh, happy to be back. Thank you for inviting me. So what I want to talk about today, and there is some overlap between some of our sessions um, in terms of I'm going to be talking about some of the same uh, wins in terms of constitutional law in the federal courts that w was discussed earlier. Am I talking too loud? No. Or you got it. Um, as well as it might be some overlap with tomorrow, but I think that's okay. Um, they say repeating information or people being able to hear information repeated is good. And of course, we're talking about some difficult stuff. So if you're not a lawyer, some of the legal jargon may be kind of going over your head. And then what I'm going to bring to it today is also marrying the law and the science. And what I say is bad science. So a lot of the work I do, for example, is focusing on when bad science is introduced in the courts. Because I am both a law professor, and so I like the idea that um, our, we are professional and we're giving good facts to the courts, and so I'm appalled when I see bad facts used. But I'm also a criminologist. Um, I have a doctorate in criminology and criminal justice, so I know the science part. And a lot of what my work does on various issues, including on sex offense laws, uh, but I do other work, is is working to translate between the two fields. Because what I find a lot of times is the lawyers and judges gloss or glaze over when scientists are talking about their science. But I also see scientists kind of gloss over when the lawyers are trying to tell them about certain con or legal principles. And so I work to try to write about and talk about things that might, that I hope can speak to both worlds to marry these. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go through some of the wins uh, that, again, have already been talked about, but then marry it with some of the bad science or junk science that I find that the government in some of these cases have been using. Um, and I'm going to tell you then after that a little, uh, some of the ways for you to tell if a government is citing a certain statistic or a certain study, ways that you can, if you dig through, try to tell whether that's bad science or they're misusing it, and also kind of how to tell whether it's good science. Because you're, you're on your own side, you want your lawyers, or at least I want the lawyers, to be using good science in a good way. And then if we get there and we kind of lost a bit of time, so I might not be able to get there, is to tell you where to find the studies. So my big point here is going to be check the science. The first thing, and there we go. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, I've written all about. So there are papers that you can download for free at this site. Um, there's no ad financial advantage to me whatsoever for you to be downloading them. It's for free. You don't have to register at the site. It's my way I, as an academic and an educator to get my information, my articles, and the data in them to you all. So this is where you can then, after the conference, find some of this work. There's also a lot of other work that you might find of interest of mine that I'm not discussing today that is there. For example, I got a lot of articles on uh, child pornography offendings and basically why they are lo even lower risk of offending and how sentencing laws have gotten crazy. So that may be of interest to some of you all. So the idea here is risk. And this morning, they've already talked about in the breakout session um, in, in three, for those of you who are there this afternoon, they talked about how the Supreme Court, or at least one of the reasons that courts keep upholding these laws, is this false notion that the recidivism rate of sex offenders is extremely high. 
So I want to take you through is in Smith versus Doe is the first time the Supreme Court said the recidivism risk of sex offenders as if it was all one homogenous group. And of course, we know they're not. They are frightening and high. And I wanted to go through with you again is check the science. You may need to dig, but find out where that came from. So it came from the Supreme Court case 2002, and they cited a National Institute of Corrections article. And you would think National Institute of Corrections, ah, oh, that's a good source, right? Well, they didn't, they're not the one who created the statistics. If you dig through, you'll find, and again, I know it was, it was discussed in that session, but I'm gonna add something new in this one, is it comes from a Psychology Today article, okay? So well, psychologists, we think that they are, respectable, they must have done an empirical study. Well, no, the Psychology Today article was written by two uh, psychological practitioners who actually ran a sex offender program in a very small, a small state program. So what did they say? In the article, they indicated that the recidivism, recidivism rate of sex offenders was high. In fact, it was as high as 80%. Okay, where did they get that 80%? Well, it turns out that the, um, one of the, uh, a reporter last year for the Sentinel had contacted um, one of the authors of it who was surprised that that statistic and their article was being used to uphold the sex offender laws. They never intended that. And the author actually said is, I regret it. It was a throwaway statement. We didn't mean it to be empirical. We didn't mean it to have this significance. Uh, we didn't run a, for example, controlled study or anything like that. So notice if you dig through, you can find it, and you can find one of the authors who says, I discounted it. I don't believe it. Even if I thought it was true then, it was off the top of my head, and I don't think it's true now. So you have a, the author of the statistic underlying this, admitting that it was basically, oh, I don't want to use fake news. It's been so bashed. I mean, I, <laughs> in any event, uh, so let's go through some of the other misuse of science. I'm not doing this. So some of the wins they've been talked uh, already discussed a little bit about, but I want to go through some of the science underlying them. Uh, Doe versus Snyder, that's the Sixth Circuit win for the Michigan uh, Michigan sex offender law, Doe versus Cooper, and then Packingham, the win is at a lower court, but there is still a win and it's still uh, being challenged. And I'm very happy today uh, to meet um, some of the workers on, uh, or lawyers litigating Cooper as well as Packingham because I've written a long article about your case. So let's go through Doe versus Snyder. Uh, this one is about Michigan's restrictions about where sex offenders can live, work, or even loiter. Uh, the federal appellate court ruled it was punitive. Um, you've already, Miriam this morning, who was on Skype or whatever she was on, she's the one or one of the attorneys responsible for this particular win. Uh, so they referred to national um, or to evidence from a national uh, national study on sex offender recidivism and showed that actually sex offenders for a general recidivism perspective, and that means committing any crime, are extremely low risk and lower risk than any other types of offenders. Now they are though, this stu particular study, and one of the reasons that um, you'll see this study if you look at the statistics cited a lot, it's one of the only nationally representative samples that we have. Otherwise, a lot of the times the studies that are referred to are of small samples. Um, and by the way, the particular study, um, there's, if you're following it, the DOJ has another study that's more recent from this, although the statistics are similar in terms of uh, they did a review of sex offenders who were released in 30 states in 2010, and they also found that sex offenders were at extremely low, lower risk of any recidivism than, they were, than other types of offenders. Um, they also, the, this particular court, so one of, the, one of the reasons I wrote about it is I thought the appellate court did a really good job of referring to the actual and the good scientific evidence here. Most courts do not. Most courts continue to cite the Supreme Court's statement that the sex offender recidivism rate is frightening and high. Uh, they also, the, so the uh, appellate court here referred to um, scientific studies indicating that by the way, these kind of restrictions probably are going to increase recidivism rate because they reduce the opportunities for sex offenders who are released to um, gain successful reentry. So they thought, wow, there's science to support these kind of laws are counterintuitive. And the, therefore, the state's assertion that they need this to protect the public um, is probably not true. <clears throat> 
So it was a really good, successful attempt about using um, good science here that the Sixth Circuit um, very fortunately and I think correctly uh, looked to. The other thing I thought was interesting too is the um, appellate court in the opinion called out state authorities saying, you've never studied whether these laws that you've had in place actually do affect the recidivism rate. And by the way, you have the data to do so. Uh, my exact, the exact quote was, uh, Michigan has never analyzed recidivism rates despite having the data to do so. Um, so this, the particular win here has actually influenced some other cases. So for example, in Idaho, um, after this case was decided, um, attorneys have now challenged Idaho's sex offender laws. And they're also bringing, um, they brought with them a lot of experts um, on the science of it and that are promoting good science. In other words, that this particular case has already been influential in terms of the litigation strategy in at least one other case. So next, if my thing will work. The other thing I want to highlight is that um, this notion that of the high recidivism rate and how dangerous sex offenders are is getting some traction in the media. So I have some headlines for you. This particular slide is going to be about headlines about this case. And notice how good this is for you, meaning that if you want to influence public opinion, if you want to influence your legislators, and you probably handing them a scientific study is not going to get you much traction, but if you give them these headlines in, in newspapers as well as magazines, maybe that will be more influential. So one about this case was a, um, the headline was judges are starting to question overzealous sex offender laws. This one was in uh, New York Magazine, and it actually cited statistics from the uh, American Association, or ATSA, what's, what's, um, Association of Treatment of Sex Abusers, thank you. <laughs> Uh, they had, they, uh, so the, um, the group that is um, the, actually the pr uh, premier group for sex offender treatment professionals, their statistics um, indicated that sex offenders are at lower risk of recidivism, although of course they're going to highlight the idea of treated sex offenders are at even lower risk of recidivism. In other words, one of the things that we're seeing uh, in the media is these reporters engaging not with the cases, but also engaging in some of the scientific evidence in uh, pretty good ways. Uh, here's another headline, perverse penalties of leper lists. Uh, a federal, judge, federal appeals uh, court finds little evidence that the burdens imposed um, by registries are necessary. This one was of uh, Reason Magazine. Uh, Reason Magazine also noted an Institute of Justice study which indicated that, um, strain, that um, strangers are not the ones that are at highest risk, particularly to our children. It's people known to us. In other words, does registry do any good if the, if the victims already know their offenders or already live with their offenders or are they engaging with their offenders? No. Um, so that was an interesting one where they were pulling out a statistical analysis that was actually not in the uh, Doe versus Snyder opinion. My last example here, sorry, I keep going back and forth in front of it. So the court says Michigan sex offender registry laws create moral lepers. This was in the Washington Post. Favorably citing it. So it doesn't mean the article goes on and chastises the court or says the court got it wrong. This is a reporter that actually buys into the better statistics. So this case has had influence in the major media outlets. So Doe versus Cooper has also been mentioned. This one's about North Carolina's restrictions on movement. Um, the court asked the state to produce evidence of risk. The state refused, apparently, maybe that's a too harsh a word, but did not promote, that's exactly accurate. did not provide any statistical evidence. For whatever reason, their particular strategy was to cite case examples. Well, look, in this case, this previously known sex offender reoffended, And they like pointed out three cases or just a handful of cases. And luckily, the court here said, well, that's not, it didn't fly with that particular court. Although that kind of strategy of case anecdotal evidence will fly with some courts, but it did not with, with this particular one. So this is the courts, in the court's opinion, their reaction to that particular strategy. 
A uh, state tries to overcome its lack of data, social science or scientific research, legislative findings or empirical findings or evidence with a renewed appeal to anecdotal case law as well as to logic and common sense. I see this across cases a lot of times when states, they sometimes even when they do try to promote or at least they cite to the good science, which really is not, is they often also call on the judges to just use your common sense and logic that sex offenders are at high risk. And that works with a lot of judges. That certainly works with our politicians. But that logic and common sense is not science. And here, most of the good science actually refutes our common sense and logic. Just real briefly, but why are there, uh, what are some of the reasons that sex offenders are actually not at high risk of recidivism? Is one is that most, um, for uh, sex crimes are mostly done, or at least the peak of age of sex offenses is at age 16, 17. It plummets, meaning the likelihood of any offender to commit, a, commit an act, um, a sexually violent act, plummets after that. Right? So therefore, if your risk plummets, then the risk of recidivism is going to plummet. Why does the risk of recidivism, even though we see the age crime curve in a lot of different crimes, it's even more pronounced for sexual offenses? Well, testosterone rates decline substantially, which doesn't have as much to do with other types of offenses. Right? It also declines for other reasons that's relevant to the age crime curve for other, other crimes. <laughs> still relevant there, it's too close to the speaker, is um, we know that once, um, so number one is kids are just stupid, right? <laughs> their brains, but there's reason, their brains are not fully developed, they're not as rational. So they may commit offenses simply because they're immature or lack impulse control. And so that as they grow older and their brain develops more, they're more able to, hopefully, but not in all cases, but in many, is able to engage self-control and not be as impulsive. Because we lo what we know is that a lot of sex crimes are opportunity, crimes of opportunity, where the offender, who usually is otherwise inclined but not always, finds a vulnerable victim, for example, and then acts upon it. We also know that one of the other reasons that there's a low recidivism rate is that once individuals, particularly young men, they get family ties, for example, they may get married, have children, get jobs, they're less likely to reoffend overall, and that's also true for sex offenses, if not even more so. So there's reasons behind this. Um, so here are the, some of the headlines for Cooper. Federal appeals court strikes down absurdly repressive North Carolina law. Isn't that a really good headline? That one is from Slate Magazine which is a mainstream magazine nationwide, but uh, online. I don't know if they're in hard copy anymore, but read by many, many. Another headline in this particular case. <laughs> Keep you awake. Things moving. Uh, two federal courts call BS on banning sex offenders from child safety, dome, safety zones. Uh, Indiana and North Carolina laws unconstitutionally vague and unjustifiably wide. This particular quote is from Reason Magazine. So some success here, not just in courts, but finally reporters, mainstream reporters, are picking up on it. Good for you, things you can cut out and send to your legislators? Sure. And then the third one is Packingham versus North Carolina, a win lower court, not a win at the state, um, state court, but Supreme Court has heard oral arguments. Now this was one where I think one of the reasons that they won in the state court, um, as well as may win um, at the Supreme Court, I hope not, is the state uses a whole bunch of junk science, right? So I wanted to go through some of what they are and start to give you some examples of how you can try to root out what are some signs of bad science? Or things that may be good science, but simply being applied inappropriately to a different population. Ready to go down my journey here? Yeah. All right. So in, uh, interestingly enough, even though you know, a number of articles are out about the frightening and high 
from the Supreme Court being bunk and the, st the study underlying the frightening and high being not a study at all and can't support anything, is still there the lawyers in Packingham for the state called the recidivism rate of sex offenders notorious. Now, what, that's not science. What does notorious mean? But they still decided to use the term. This DOJ study comes up again, but here is uh, where, at least in the lower court, um, what the attorneys were successful at is to point out, hey, that report doesn't support the state side. That report actually supports the plaintiff side. So this was the one where the, uh, I had mentioned it just a little bit ago, is our nationally representative sample, where they found that sex offenders, in terms of committing another sex offense, only occurred in 5% of cases, only meaning, in other words, only 5% were re-arrested for a sex offense. Now, 5% to me does not seem high, but I argue you shouldn't use re-arrest rates because actually this study also indicated that the reconviction rate of sex offenders committing another sex offense after they were re released was 3.5%. 3.5% it, to me, is not notorious, and it's not frightening and high. One of the reasons I differentiate there, and be careful when you, if you're looking at people citing the recidivism rates, is how are they defining recidivism? If they're defining it re-arrest, re-arrest is not, not conviction. And we know, it, for example, one reason that actually the re-arrest rate may over-inflate recidivism rates, particularly for sex offenders, <laughs> is we know that sex, formerly known sex offenders, meaning those who already have a record, particularly those who are registered, are more likely to be pick, picked up by police on additional crimes because the police have a presumption that, oh, I got a new rape, I'm going to go find the people who've already been arrested for rape or who are on the, um, the registries. So in other words, it's very likely that more sex offenders or, or formerly known sex offenders are going to be picked up on arrest for new crimes who didn't do it for that reason. So 3.5% is actually a better one. Also be careful here about studies when they define recidivism to include, for example, a new arrest for failure to register. How is that a new sex offense? But some studies will count that. But also note that to the extent that states argue we need these registries because look, sex offenders, known sex offenders are more likely to be rearrested. If they're likely to be rearrested for the registry, that's kind of counterintuitive, or you know, it's never ending cycle. Well, it's because you created that new statute and that new requirement that they are rearrested on. That's not really the same. Also be careful here in terms of recidivism uh, rates is, are, they, are you talking about contact versus non-contact offending? One of the problems with recidivism studies in general, but also apply here is, here, researchers, when they study recidivism, they tend to count recidivism the first time the person reoffended, meaning they don't differentiate whether the offender committed one additional offense versus 20 additional offenders. They count the same. They often don't differentiate the severity of the new offense. So the person, for example, who is picked up again for, say, peeping a peeping Tom, they count that the same as the person who actually committed a series of uh, very uh, violent rapes. They're counted the same. Are they the same? No. Some of them will count, for example, a child pornography offense as if it's a contact offense. So, just some things that uh, scientists, at least the, the good ones, can point out to you, which is a recidivism study, you, you have to be careful to understand what all went into it, because that could have affected substantially the numbers that the study is coming up with. More on Packingham. So interestingly, in Packingham in the Supreme Court, there was an amicus brief, and that's a friend of the court brief by 13 other states who are afraid that, um, that, that the plaintiffs might win in Packingham, and if they do win at the Supreme Court, that would, be, that would affect and have precedential value for the sex offender laws in their states. So 13 states banded together to write, this, write a common brief, and they decided to use some additional statistics to try to convince the Supreme Court that some of these sex offender laws are required. 
So they cite three studies to support the idea that sex offenders are at high risk of recidivism. Okay. So note my first one is they said, well, look, this study says 52% of child molesters are re were rearrested on new sex offenses. So I decided I'm going to go to that study and figure out what was, what was studied, right? Because I'm questioning methodology, because that's a high number, 52%. Wouldn't that scare everybody? I, that would be high to me, might be notorious. Well, it was a study of civilly committed predators who were released from a secure hospital 30 years before. So what's wrong with the applicability of this study to a general population of registered sex offenders in North Carolina? Civilly committed sexual predators? That's something, I mean, you're talking about your already extreme high risk offender group because only the hopefully high, most high risk can be civilly committed. Civil commitment also requires that the person have be diagnosed with a severe mental illness. That's differentiating this population. And they weren't, by the way, released from prison like our registered sex offenders in North Carolina to which that statute applies. These are people released from a hospital 30 years ago. What's the relevance of 30 years ago? Is sex offender rates have gone down substantially in that 30 year period. Meaning that even for those offenders that were studied then, the sexual predators who were released from the hospital, their base rate of offending has gone down in the 30 years. Just another reason to make it inapplicable. So the next uh, result that the amicus brief highlights is, look, 53% of sex offenders were previously convicted of sex offenses. 53% sounds high, so I understand why they're doing it from a strategy perspective, but they are obliterating the science of it. That was study was also civilly committed offenders with severe mental illness released from hospitals 45 years ago. Do you notice a theme here? Are they kind of cherry picking studies? The third one and final one on this particular point, 31% of extrafamilial child molesters are reconvicted. And they also had a pretty high rate for intrafamiliar, but I have too many statistics already. But in any event, patients released from a maximum security facility in Canada. What's the relevance there? Rates of recidivism for sex offenders varies by country, varies within country. And for some reason, I haven't figured this out, the sex offender recidivism rate in Canada tends to be higher than the US. But the sex offender reoffense re re rate for Minnesota is also higher, so I'm wondering if it's something about being in the north. Not quite sure. <laughs> so in any event, um, so the point here is, a study of offenders in Canada has nothing to do with a general group of registered sex offender in North Carolina. It's inapplicable from a scientific perspective. And yes, and, and 30 years ago. So do you notice some of the cherry picking here? In contrast, though, on the other side of it, uh, the ATSA, again, uh, was cited, and they, they also submitted an amicus brief, I think with you all. Was that one that you all joined? Uh, study about, they cited more applicable studies, which is they cited about six or seven studies from U.S. states. Oh, they stayed in the U.S. About sex offenders who were released from prison. And what they found was the sexual recidivism rate across those studies was about 2 to 3%. Although in one state it was, I think, as high as 6%, but I'm not quite sure what's going on there. But they, in other words, they cite more reasonable studies that are more general. Although they're not North Carolina, but apparently they didn't have the statistics or were able to find it for North Carolina. But it's certainly much more relevant to this population than the studies that the states had indicated. Although, admittedly, it's also not differentiating registered versus unregistered sex offenders. And the reason there is that uh, apparently there's not yet available really good studies that just focus on registered versus non-registered sex offenders. But I do want to do point out that there is one, one issue with it, but that's a relatively minor one compared to the big issues of the studies that the, um, the states collectively uh, put forward. Okay, so what are, oops, 
Oops. Uh, some additional ones. The state also, uh, in, in Packingham, tried to make the case for the need um, to apply, so the, the, basically the laws were applying whether or not the uh, registered sex offenders had had adult victims versus uh, child victims. So they were trying to make the case for the fact of crossover offending. So their claim is that it doesn't matter that those who, who have had adult victims are also very likely to have child victims and vice versa. They cited five particular studies for this, and I don't have time to go through all of it, but I wanted to point out a few of the problems when I went to those studies to find out why do they show really high rates of crossover offending? Why, do they show, why did they show that the offenders had both adult and, or most of the offenders had adult and child victims? One of the, one of the issues is, I'll have to do some of this brief, but if you want to know more about it, it's in an article at that link that I told you, is they had questionable definitions of sexual reoffending. For instance, um, some of the, several of the, the five studies counted as reoffending any homosexual act, regardless of what it was, regardless of whether it violated law. They counted it as a sexual reoffense. They counted prostitution as a, that, as a sexual offense. They counted peeping, being a peeping tom. They even counted some of them obscene phone calls. So when you broaden your definition beyond a crime, then isn't that a problem with the study results? I would think yes. The, um, they, included, they included acts when the offenders were children themselves, when they were as young as three years old. All of them included acts when the children were young. And they, again, they did not differentiate whether that act violated law. So any time, for example, the individual indicated I had sexual contact with another child, they counted that as offense without regard to how old they both were, right? And without kind of regard to was it playing doctor, they would count that as a sexual offense. Two six-year-olds together, for example. They even counted consensual sex even where it's not statutory rape if they were both as long as the other person was under age 18. They relied on self-reports. How much do we remember? And, they, and, and all of them counted all sexual activity from basically day one. Do you remember every sexual episode, I need another term, every sexual act you've done your entire life and can re, somehow can recount it to these people? Well, they expected that. But the problem is memory. Do we really remember all of this? But I'm going to bring that into the next problem, which is all of these self-reports, or actually for four out of the five studies, were through polygraph examinations. We, what are some of the problems with admissions in polygraph examinations with sex offender treatment? There are many of them. I can only count a few with time here. Is As you know, they're often pressured to keep admitting new offenses. So for example, are some of these studies reliable? I'll just give you a couple items. If one particular study said one, um, the highest amount of number of victims one of the offenders in their study reported was somehow the person was able to recount 215 separate victims. And he was able to specifically state 6,075 incidents of sexual conduct, mis misconduct. He had in one person, 6,075. I, I was asked how old the person was. I don't, don't know. They don't give that. And in another one, and these are just examples, but all of them came out with these huge numbers where I'm thinking, how could anybody possibly even remember all that? Uh, another one, uh, particular one is, on average, they say they're the individuals reported 290 incidents of sexual misconduct. On average. But, so when I get, get um, there's many other problems with this. Oh, false confessions that we just, we know why there's false confessions with the sex offender polygraph is the, all these people were in treatment and they, there was some consequence if they didn't successfully um, complete treatment. 
And so if your, uh, your treatment provider believes you had more victims than you admit to and you don't admit to it and you get booted out of the program, uh, it depended on the study, but for some of them, they were, their uh, parole was going to be violated. For some of them, they were in a, really, they, they were in a place um, in the jail that they liked that felt safe, and if they were booted out of the program, they were going to be moved back to general population. That was scarier for them. But just a few examples of why there's a really high rate of probably of false confessions in these. The guy who said 6,075 incidents, I don't know about that one. <laughs> the next thing North Carolina does then is to assert, so the, uh, this particular aspect was to uphold a ban on social networking sites. So they also tried to justify why they needed a ban, um, which is they had to kind of try to argue that registered sex offenders somehow are at greater risk to our children using social networking sites. So one study they pointed out to was actually a study uh, by a British police department of complaints about online activity. Complaints. They were not justified complaints. They were not arrests. They were simply citizens calling and saying, I think something, somebody's doing something wrong online. Do we have a problem there of it being Britain? Yes. I do. They didn't. It has no relevant data, right? Because, again, it was not limited to substantiate. It was not limited to things that were crimes. Citizens don't always know what crimes are. And, in fact, when I went back to the, British rep the underlying report here, what they actually say is most of the people who are trying to use social networking sites to contact children were not even in our country. How does that support that North Carolina to protect their children needs a ban on North Carolina sex offenders? It doesn't at all. And the report goes on to say is in most of the cases of where what did constitute online sexual, child sexual abuse, it didn't involve strangers, it didn't even involve adults. In many of the cases, for example, the child pornography being produced was from the kids themselves. Didn't even evolve a third party. In other words, this support that they're highlighting, the state, doesn't support any of that need for, for a social networking ban. And it doesn't support the idea that registered sex offenders are at greater risk of using social networking sites to abuse children. No support whatsoever. In fact, the, the report itself refutes those notions. Uh, here's what they misquote. They go on to cite another study. Okay. There's a group of um, researchers at the Child uh, Crimes Against Children uh, div Research Division of the University of New Hampshire, who's done a lot of studies on general crimes against children, but they've also focused a lot on sex abuse crimes against children. And they've also produced some nationally representative samples uh, in terms of studies about um, using various social networking sites in the web and all um, to engage in um, online, sex, uh, online child sexual abuse. So their claim for this, so I like the study. I think the, the study is valid. I don't have methodological problems with it. But what the state cites is that 82% of online sex crimes against minors, uh, the offenders use social networking sites to gain information about the victim's likes and dislikes. Not true. Actually, only 22%. They increased it by 60%. And there's reasons I can't go into, but it's in my paper, that they got the statistic entirely wrong. Right? And by the way, most of the 22% were undercover officers. So it actually didn't, they weren't mining the likes and dislikes of actual children. That was a very small percentage. It's mostly um, undercover officers who are getting these making these arrests by faking being children. Their next claim was that 62% of online sex crimes against minors, the offenders use the victim's social networking site to find information about their home and schools. That's a little bit over much because it's actually only 5%. Close. <laughs> Unfortunately, the attorney for the state of North Carolina cited these statistics again when before the Supreme Court in oral arguments. They got the statistics wrong. They continue to get it wrong. I hope for my profession it was simply a mistake and not intentional to mislead the Supreme Court on the facts.
Okay, so what are some of the headlines? I don't know, maybe you all can tell us whether you've seen these or not. The big lie about sex offenders. Now this one was, it, it was talking about Packingham, but it was going back to that original frightening and high from the Supreme Court. This one, the Washington Post. Next one. Did the Supreme Court base a ruling on a myth? Even though they're going back to the Supreme Court, it was Packingham as the case that got the reporter, probably, or one of them that got the reporter interested. This one, I might, you might not have heard of this newspaper, the New York Times. <laughs> Do you know your, yeah? So clip out these articles, send them to your legislators. So I might, uh, bringing back the theme here is check the statistics, <laughs> check the studies, um, get, have a critical eye to them. <coughs> so some things too, and I want to uh, open it up for questions. So some things to look at, and I give you, you some examples here is what, what, who did that, those researchers study? Is that group anything like this particular group that they're trying to, or this individual they're trying to assign it to? Um, so, for example, a lot of the risk assessment, particularly for sex offender risk assessment tools, there's the studies, um, the, no, the samples that were studied in the tool themselves were often not U.S. populations. Uh, so, therefore, that particular risk assessment, for example, shouldn't be used on any U.S. population. Look as to whether, for example, the group study were only adults. If so, should not be applied to children because there are risk-relevant differences between children and adults. Was it a study but only on male offenders? If so, it's totally inapplicable to female offenders because there are things that are extremely different in terms of recidivism between men and women. Uh, I already mentioned location. And then also look at the years for the reason I mentioned before is because our base rate of, of sexual offending in the US is low um, and has decreased substantially over the last 30 years. So a study that indicated even if it was on a similar group, even in a similar site, if you're using the risk of recidivism 30 years ago, 20 years ago, it's inapplicable now because the rates are much lower for a variety of reasons. Um, but I yeah, don't. Oh, just really quickly, a couple other things. Um, these are not cases, but I wanted to give you another idea of where you might get traction. This was um, the Colorado, the Denver Post has been reporting on conflicts of interest between the polygraphers that were are hired in their state to do sexual offender polygraphs, um, and they've gotten. Um, because of the, partly because of the monetary aspect of it, they've gotten some traction where some legislators in Colorado are now <laughs> being negative against the use of monies for these sexual offender polygraphs. But the link is, or one of the big links is, the conflict of interest and the money involved. But that could be something that is a successful strategy to you as well, pointing out the cost of, for example, registries in your state, the cost of police trying to supervise where people are living to the extent that there's a residency restriction. And then one other thing, this doesn't have anything um, to do with these cases, but I just one I liked as well, headline, register the flaw. You like that? Play on words, new evidence, US sex offender policies are actually causing more crime. The reason I highlighted this is this particular reporter uh, are, was mining other, scienti or other scientific studies, for example, indicating that um, uh, one example was California study that indicated that sex offenders who were homeless because of the residency restriction were more likely to recidivate than those who weren't and the nature of how the connection between the residency restrictions led to the homelessness which actually increased recidivism rather than decreased and the reporter cited a couple other studies there um, that one was in oh quartz magazine So you got my contact information again. What can I answer for you? Remember, we have a microphone. Please use the microphone. Here I come. Would you please put your link to your papers up there again? It was taken down before I could copy all of it. Right there. Yeah. 
Oh, clearing the ball. Okay, that was real hard to say. Yes, ma'am. Oh. oh, sorry. I'll wait. To That's okay. Somebody. You're in control. Uh, just an answer on your Canada question. Until 2008, the age of consent in Canada was 14. So to get convicted of a sexual offense in Canada against a minor, the minor had to be less than 14 years of age. And even in the DOJ statistics, it shows that offenders who have younger victims are slightly higher to recidivate than those with adolescent victims. So that may account for some of the difference in Canada's statistics. <laughs> yeah, so not just their weather. Um, but one of the reasons probably for the younger the age, the higher the, the risk of recidivism, is that the younger the age of the victim, the more likely the perpetrator is young as well. Uh, the more likely they are also a juvenile. And as I indicated, juveniles are particularly teenagers are at higher, they, they commit more sex offenders offenses. So that would help explain that. I was, you seem to know a lot about the studies and stuff. I'm wondering if you're aware of any that are out there regarding people that are developmentally disabled, either with just sex offenses or just crime. They just seem to get caught up in this a lot. A very good point. And so anecdotally, what I've noticed in the last couple, not only I, but some others who uh, worked um, in this field, is anecdotally we're getting um, evidence of uh, those with learning disabilities and other um, uh, other issues that are getting often in the child pornography stuff, but also committing sex offenses. There are no studies to date I know of because the, the number of them, they're not really in any one site for a researcher to study well. There's anecdotal evidence and some researchers start, are starting to write about it. So one of, the develop, one of the issues I think that is relevant to a developmental disorder and committing a sex offense, whether it's contact or non-contact involving another child, is those with developmental or, or disorders often see the other children, even if they're much younger than them, as their peers. So to them, for example, downloading child pornography, they think this is my peer, even if the person may be 18, 20. Uh, so I, and, and so that's now just developing, but I don't know of any studies on it yet because they're just not located in any one population for a researcher to have the ability to study. But I've occasionally gotten contact from lawyers or parents um, who have brought those issues to me. What is the accountability mechanism because we're not talking about simple errors and statistics here. I mean, we're talking about clearly out and right deception, it looks like. I mean, so what's the accountability here? Can anybody just stand up in the Supreme Court and say anything they feel like? <laughs> Y'all want to answer? What? Where's the Jewish, the jurisprudence, you know, mechanism of accountability okay. here? I can't, I mean, the. So I've faced this issue. I'm waiting for that. Um, my name is Paul Dubling, and I've done some of this litigation before. And the, the answer is um, you tend to lose your case is really the accountability. But the trick is my take as an advocate, and this isn't the only answer, is falsely making a statement to a court. If it could be shown that you knew it was false, you made it for the purpose of misleading the court, could get you disbarred. But more often you have situations like this where someone can claim it was an error or they did some weird calculation. And the state does this a lot. But my take and my true answer to you is it provides an opportunity. When the state does this, you're trading on credibility. And every time your opponent says something that's not supported or potentially misleading, the real answer is to have the right statistic immediately at your fingertips and point it out to the court right away. One, to prevent that fact from lodging in the court's brain, but two, ultimately, it is a credibility contest. And particularly in an area like this, where both sides are sort of spinning facts in the way that you want, the advocate who can seize the high ground and acknowledge when a fact is against them and address it and point out when their opponent is going off the rails is much more likely to win simply because they're much more, much more trustworthy. So it's not a great answer, but really the answer is be prepared as an advocate and jump on it. And jump on it for the purpose of showing that you wouldn't do that and that they're lying their butt off. Well, that's obvious. I'm just wondering, is there an internal mechanism in the bar 
itself. Yes, you, you can be disbarred for making a false statement to the court. Yeah, my guess is, is um, they don't know what they're saying is false. And one of the reasons is, um, so I am a law professor and might, might be partly responsible for this, okay. is we don't teach law students how to ferret through these studies. We don't teach them social science. We don't teach them empirical skills. We don't teach them to have a critical eye to what is science. Um, so our law students and then lawyers are enamored with this idea of science. Um, so my guess is they don't really know. For my part, my, my response mechanism is I write about it and publish it. And I talk to groups like here, like the, like you all. I talk to um, the federal, I've been before the Federal Defenders Conference numerous times. I've talked to judges. Um, I try to publicly educate by making my papers available online. So that's my attempt to do this. I've had some success in terms of um, some of these articles for these reasons, refuting some of the statements put out by government officials is it, it's, starting, it's starting to be cited. Um, and in, for example, there's a Supreme Court case um, pending that the Supreme Court has not decided to rule on it where some of my papers as well as some of my other colleagues in social science are being starting to be cited. So that's my own professional response to it. Yes. Hi. Um, since you brought, you, it's interesting you brought up the topic of uh, violent versus nonviolent. Uh, my son was convicted of uh, child pornography and, uh, and since you've also brought up Canada, I'm from London, Ontario. And uh, a year ago, there was a sting conducted largely by the Ontario Provincial Police, but they brought in a whole bunch of other police forces for the press conference, including Homeland Security. <laughs> that was part of the investigation. Uh, they labeled it a massive sting of 80 people arrested. And then they attached the schedule and I analyzed it. Out of the 80, only 20%, 16 were violent sexual crimes. Uh, the other 64 were uh, 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 downloading child pornography, viewing or di distributing it. So uh, my reaction to that was they basically have a very good system for catching people that are guilty of child pornography, viewing and distribution. They use that and work at very efficiency because the conviction rate at home is about 98%. That allows them to say uh, we have a, we've had a massive child abuse sting very successful one, rather than saying, we've only convicted 16 people in the last two years, that's the best we can do. So I think they kind of pad their stats by using the, the child pornography arrests. Uh, just they, an observation. Uh, they do. So what has happened, um, and I kind of analyze this to the drug war, which is instead of going after the, you know, the kingpins of the drug war, they go after the low level uh, users on the streets. Here is instead of going after the actual child molesters um, who are adults, they're going after the low hanging fruit, which is the easier ones to get, which is those who are online downloading or distributing child pornography. Um, so the state's reaction to that is meaning that when, when they conflate the child pornographer downloaders with the actual child molesters, is they argue that the child pornographer downloaders are fueling the market for further sexual abuse, contact abuse. There is no evidence of that. In fact, there's evidence against that. There is no market there that they are supporting because it's freely available. So what's happened in, in sorry, I'm going off on this tangent because I've written a lot about it, is the reason that there's a growing trove of child pornography online is not that additional images or new images are being taken. There are some, but most of it is because the old stuff that was in hard copy is now digitized. There's also the, the um, group I mentioned, the uh, Crimes Against Children group, have done really good nationally representative samples of child pornography production here in the US. And what they found is it's mostly of um, consensual relationships where the pornography gets um, somehow online. In other words, their study indicates that almost nobody here in the U.S. is producing child pornography to be able to trade or to be able to sell. There's really no market to sell it anyway. And a lot of the images are actually now self um, image, so self taken. What do I want to say? Self <laughs> They're, so p the kids producing them themselves, trading it with their friends who are then sending it to other people. So that's the, we don't have a market here in the U.S. for that. So, but anyway. Last, oh. last question, I think yeah, um, you mentioned that, you know, the difficulty with these studies is they're often small or, you know, they're, they're different if you want to compare. 
uh, two questions. The first is, what are your thoughts, plus positive and negative, about meta-analyses? Do you like them or not? The second one, and it's sort of a, a more rhetorical question, is have we sufficiently, or have you guys sufficiently debunked the Butner study now <laughs> to not only say it's poor science, but it's really fraud within the prison industrial complex to generate more business for themselves? I mean, so that. let me take the second one. I have done so. There's a paper online you can find at my site where I specifically debunk the Butner study. So the Butner study, for those who don't know it, is the one that was done by um, treatment, treatment professionals in the federal system who claim that child pornographer downloaders and distributors are at high risk of recidivism. Uh, there are many methodological, methodological problems with that. Um, I think also ethical because how are you studying these people and asserting that they are dangerous when you're their treatment provider? Um, I think they did it because for their own personal gain. I'm on the record for this. Um, and they, I'm, uh, and these are people who went to the marshal's office afterwards. So I've always known I've been a target, but nothing has happened to me yet. Um, but there, so I got that one. And your first one was a meta-analysis. So a meta-analysis is when a researcher, uh, because a lot of times for resource purposes, money purposes, um, a lot of these studies are very using very small samples. Is that often doesn't give you statistical significance. So what meta-analysis try to do is then combine what should be like studies into one bigger study that can have more statistical impact. The issues there, do I believe it's a good um, methodology? Statistically, sure, but if it's only if it's done correctly. Um, and what I have found, in, at least in terms of I've studied in more detail on the risk assessment tools for sex offenses, is they're putting together unlike studies. So it's a problem, although they still do it, is if your definition, for example, of recidivism in one of the studies is, say, re-arrest, but the other study it's reconviction, you're kind of meshing apples and oranges. Or if you take a study that, um, and try, that is only adults and you do a meta-analysis also with a study that includes kids, you're kind of mixing things up. And unfortunately, they do that a lot um, in part because the meta-analysis researcher doesn't have control of those things. Uh, so there, there's goods and bads, and I've written some about that. But thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.